Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Gary Severance with Henry Schein, and I will be your moderator this evening. I'm very excited to welcome Eric Pook, President, Cirrus Consulting Group, and Jim Brady, Senior Director of Sales, Henry Schein Financial Services, as our speakers tonight. They will be covering inflation, interest rates, the economy, and how it all impacts your dental office. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping. If you have any questions, please type it into the box labeled have a question on your console, and we will answer them live at the end. If you have pertinent questions, both of the speakers may address them during the program. This webinar is sponsored by Cirrus. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Eric and Jim, welcome, and thank you for being with us tonight. I'll pass it over to you guys. Fantastic. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate Thank it. You, so as Gary mentioned, I'm Jim Brady. I'm the Senior Director of Sales for Henry Schein Financial Services and uh, very excited to be here tonight to discuss a few topics with you that are uh, likely very top of mind, given that they've been continually in the news cycle, uh, particularly around inflation and rising interest rates. Um, I'm joined by Eric Pook, the President of Cirrus Consulting Group. Eric and I are going to split things up a little bit so you don't have to listen to just one person for the next hour, um, but thank you in advance for joining us this evening. I'm coming to you live from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, Gary's gone through some of the disclosures, just one additional quick one. Um, please, all, as always, consult your financial advisor prior to kind of making any particular investing decisions. So uh, let's jump right in. Um, what are the learning objectives for tonight? So here's myself and Eric. And um, so first, I'm going to give you some kind of basics on inflation, interest rates, what they are, how they impact your practice, and then discuss, importantly, uh, some strategies that you can implement to combat those rising costs. Um, likely, the second largest cost in your practice is your rent expense. Uh, so Eric's going to take you in depth through some strategies and how to reduce your tenancy cost, how to negotiate different clauses in your lease. And then lastly, how to compare two different properties uh, if you're trying to decide between uh, two different locations for an expansion or a relocation. So as you can see, packed agenda tonight. Uh, very excited that you're here with us. Thank you for joining. Um, before we get into you know, the specifics, we, in an effort to kind of make this as interactive as possible, uh, we've got three poll questions. Um, I'll bring up the first. Um, that, we, that I, we'd like you all to answer uh, in the uh, presentation here. Um, and uh, the, again, there should be popping up. We're gonna give you about 30 seconds each here to answer each question. Uh, this really allows us to better understand kind of why you're all here tonight and tailor the message appropriately kind of as we go through. So first question here, as you can see, what, which best describes your current situation? Uh, planning to open or relocate your practice, planning to acquire a practice, planning to transition or sell your practice in the next five years, or planning to uh, stay put and renegotiate my lease, or uh, none of the above. So I'll give you a couple of more seconds here. Um, I know there's a little bit of a delay uh, between uh, what I see and what you all see. All right, second question, um, pretty clear. When does your current lease expire? Uh, my lease has already expired and I'm on a month to month agreement. It's up due in the next two years, due in two to five years, due over five years. I own my unit or building, or lastly, I don't have a lease or don't have a lease yet. So I'll give you a couple more seconds to answer that question. And these are great to help look at leverage and helping to strategize as you look forward across the next two years. Fantastic. And we'll, the last one is real easy. Are you interested in a complimentary 15 minute consultation with the Eric Pook uh, to discuss your current situation? Uh, your lease or local rent analysis? Yes or no? Flattery will get you everywhere, Joe. <laughs> OK, 
give you a couple more seconds. I know a number of you had reached out in advance. I know there's some fairly urgent situations as well as a number of you just looking for some great uh, just local rent information as well. So looking forward to connecting with many of you if you haven't connected already. Fantastic. So now we've got a little bit of feedback from you all. Uh, thanks for doing that. Um, let's jump in. Um, before I go through kind of this slide really quickly, some background on Henry Schein Financial Services for those of you who aren't aware. Uh, so Henry Schein Financial Services or HSFS uh, provides financing solutions uh, for essentially kind of all of your practice finance needs. Uh, whether you're simply looking to kind of obtain a loan for a single one-off piece of equipment or taking on a much larger project um, like an expansion or relocation or an acquisition, uh, we utilize the power of Shine uh, and our exclusive lending partnerships and banking relationships to provide you uh, with the funds that you need for really nearly any scenario within your practice. So, of course, feel free to reach out to me directly if you've got any financing needs. So, uh, what is inflation? So, don't uh, go too deep into these numbers because your eyes may glaze over. Uh, but first off, let's kind of establish some basics about inflation. So we hear a lot about this in the news. Um, you feel it in your wallets every single day and in your practices, but what is it actually and how is it tracked? So inflation in its simplest form is an increase in price, right? So it's funny, uh, Eric and I put this description for this webinar uh, back together in, in March. And if you remember, it said the annual infl inflation uh, in the US accelerated to eight and a half percent. Well, unfortunately, um, and it's kind of as we all feel every day, that trend has not slowed significantly. Um, and as of June, that number is now over 9%. But what does that actually mean here? Um, so you know, the most popular measure of inflation is CPI. And both Eric and I are going to spend some time talking about this. But um, CPI is the Consumer Price Index. Um, and it tracks you know, the price of certain goods uh, that are purchased by consumers like you and I. And it's calculated by the Bureau of Labor and Statistics. Um, and it represents a weighted average of prices uh, for goods uh, and services within a specific particular group. So when you hear kind of in the nightly news that inflation rose 9.1% in June, what they really mean is kind of across all these different categories included in CPI, food, energy, services, et cetera, et cetera, uh, prices rose over 9%. So what you could buy with a dollar a year ago now costs you a dollar ten. So um, the Bureau of Labor and Statistics tracks CPI in aggregate across kind of all of these different sectors um, and, in, and in individual categories, including dental services. So the chart you see on the right-hand side of your screen is all of the major sectors included within CPI. Um, so across all these sectors in aggregate, um, prices rose 9.1% in June. So dental services is also specifically tracked as included in kind of medical care, the medical care services category. Um, and dental services has actually risen 2%, which you may think that's not all that much. Um, however, it's actually the largest month over month increase uh, ever recorded since uh, the Bureau started tracking dentistry kind of independently in 95. Um, so that 2% is cost to your patient, not specifically to you, but kind of more on that uh, in, in a couple of minutes here. So I'm not going to go into detail on kind of why prices climb. Uh, this is, after all, this is kind of is not a, an econ class tonight. Um, but ultimately, um, uh, we are here kind of to learn about kind of how this impacts your practice and what you can do about it. So let's just say like the reason that prices uh, increase is is really multifactorial, right? So you've got the pandemic, you've got geopolitical factors, you've got changes in consumer behavior, supply chain disruptions labor shortages, rising wages, et cetera, et cetera, that you hear of all the time. Um, and these are all kind of factors into why uh, inflation occurs. And it really kind of affects everyone. It affects you, your practice, your staff, and your patients. Um, but specifically, kind of how does it impact your practice? Uh, and it, it kind of may be oversimplistic to say this, but it, it's really in two primary ways. It impacts demand for your services, right? So patients are affected by this. They're looking to save money. Naturally, when they do that, they cut costs places um, and may be delaying treatment as a result. So the good news is, as you've likely seen, unemployment is still near record lows. So you're not likely seeing patients delay treatment for lack of insurance coverage, like you may have seen for those of you who were practicing um, during the start of the Great Recession in 2008. Secondly, it impacts your costs. So everything that you purchase for your practice seems to cost more, I'm sure. 
most notably, and what is kind of undoubtedly your largest two expenses, staff salaries and tenancy costs or rent. So you know, multi, multiple things coming, coming together here, um, compound kind of what is already a fiercely competitive marketplace for talent, not just for hygienists and assistants, but for front office staff and associates, for those of you who have associates, uh, compound that all with inflation and you, what you've likely experienced is an increase in your staff salaries over the last 18 months. And if not, likely will. As we all know, keeping staff happy and retaining them is one of the most critical parts of running a successful practice and keeping a successful practice. Um, but your employees have seen a drastic increase in their cost of living, just like you have. So your standard 2 to 4% cost of living increase year over year is likely kind of not going to be viewed as enough to your, to your existing staff. So if your staff isn't already clamoring about this, they likely will. So all that's well and good. Um, so what? Um, I'm going to go through some basic strategies to combat those rising costs. But there's one thing you kind of take away from my portion of the presentation tonight. It's that you simply can't absorb the cost of inflation at your personal expense. We've kind of got the luxury of seeing financial statements from dental practices across the country all day long. And recently, what I can tell you is unless you're taking some sort of action, your margins are going to erode. And as a result, they're going to hurt your pocket. Um, so before we get into some basics, I do want to provide some basic understanding of interest rates as well. Um, so let's advance the slide here. Um, so another really ugly slide with a bunch of scary looking graphs. Don't worry so much about the graphs, but you can't really talk about inflation uh, without talking about interest rates. So one of the tools that the government has to tamper down inflation uh, is by rising interest rates. Um, the thought is that kind of higher interest rates reduce consumer purchasing power uh, because stuff costs more, right? And because stuff costs more, uh, consumers will eventually buy less and eventually prices will start to stabilize, or at least that's kind of the theory or basic concept. Whether or not that works out in practice is another, another question, um, but that's a conversation for another day. So when you hear in the news, kind of the Federal Reserve raised interest rates again, it means that they've raised what's called the federal funds rate. Um, the federal funds rate is not the interest rate that you and I receive. Uh, it's the rate that banks charge each other for overnight loans. Again, not an econ course, so I won't go too deep here, but uh, loosely, as you can imagine, uh, if costs go up for banks or financial institutions, eventually interest rates on everything else is going to follow. So while the Fed does not directly control interest rates uh, that the banks charge consumers, it can affect the cost of banks and as a result, consumers. So uh, in July, the Fed raised uh, the Fed funds rate by three quarters of a percent or 75 basis points. The second 75 basis point hike in two months, which really is um, kind of really previously unprecedented. So, so you've got some kind of general understanding of the historical rate environment. The chart at the bottom of the slide represents the Fed funds rate since uh, 1998. And I know it's really small here, uh, but it peaks around six and a half percent in 2000, 2001, and then has held near zero during the recession. And then interest rates, as you can see, start to tick back up after we start to come out of the recession. And then what you see is kind of COVID hits and then interest rates are set back down near zero. Um, the chart on the top is simply the 30 year average uh, fixed mortgage rate. As I mentioned, and as you'll see there on the slide, um, while the Fed doesn't directly impact mortgage rates, um, you'll see a familiar kind of fluctuation as the Fed raises and lowers rates. Um, so that's, again, all well and good, but how does it impact you and how you can impact your practice? Not surprisingly, just like the conclusion of the previous slide, um, this means your costs are up. Simply, it costs you more to borrow. Um, now, you might be saying to yourself, okay, Jim, you, know, you just told me inflation's up, interest rates are up, everything costs more. Um, I hear every night on the nightly news that we may be headed into recession. I'm going to go hunker down. I'm going to try to weather out these storms. I mean, that certainly is a strategy. And kind of while I can't specifically tell you what strategy is best, I can give you some tips that might help. Um, and as you'll see, they really all come back to ensuring that you're informed about what's going on in your practice and looking for ways to increase revenue and decrease cost. So um, five strategies to combat rising costs. And I admit they're pretty basic, um, but generally and generally fit into kind of three buckets. So you can increase the price of your services, you can increase the number of people or patients who are paying you, um, and you can increase or you can increase per patient revenue. So while it seems basic, you'd be really surprised at how few practices and practice owners actually sit down and strategize 
on these types of things, particularly in this environment. So first, increase fees. So regular review of your fee schedule is always prudent, particularly in this environment, as the slide says. Um, but unless you are really a true fee-for-service and cash-only practice, raising your fees or your price is not kind of as simple as other businesses or industries, um, particularly the time when PPO reimbursement continues to fall, not increase. Um, if your payer mix is majority PPO, you can't simply expect to raise your fees and then magically you'll see your reimbursement percentage increase. It's just not realistic, right? Um, but assuming you do have some fee-for-service patients, review and increase of your fees is kind of good solid practice management. Um, and one of the first steps to raising rates is really understanding where you are com uh, compared to your peers in your area. Shine does provide um, a fee review service that allow you, allows you to benchmark your fees against your competition if you're interested. Um, historically, even before this period of high inflation, an annual increase of 3% was recommended. And then I also should mention, because you're probably hearing about some of this uh, in your, your local communities and local practices, um, about implementing kind of a flat additional fee to combat inflation. Um, call it whatever you'd like, a, a, an inflation um, inflation fee or inflation surcharge. I've heard a couple of different uh, terms for it. Um, not dissimilar to some of the PPE fees that you were charging or likely charging during the height of the pandemic. It's obviously one strategy to increase revenue, uh, particularly in a primarily primary PPO uh, practice. So that's option one. Um, investing in equipment and technology to increase production. So um, I'm sure you're saying, are you suggesting I spend more money at a time like this? Um, and the answer is really yes, particularly because of what we've already discussed. Um, it's not just as easy as charging an additional 10% for that crown um, and boom, you kind of, you beat inflation. Um, you need to find ways to actually increase your per patient revenue and increase efficiency. Um, you know, the latest digital pan or CAD CAM full system is uh, not just there to provide you better patient care, it's there to allow you to operate more efficiently. Um, it's not just hand speed anymore, it's processing time too. So how fast can your equipment process what you need to do is nearly as important. And in the end, the less time you and your staff um, can spend um, processing equipment and with your equipment, the more time it frees you up to, uh, to be chair side. You know, adding a CBCT doesn't just kind of help locate canals better among, amongst other things, uh, it allows you to uh, complete the procedure faster. Uh, third example, kind of adding an intraoral scanner, let's say, um, uh, doesn't just offer you kind of an, an, uh, the ability to offer clear aligners, uh, but provides you kind of the potential to uh, a, or a new source of revenue. So uh, overall, kind of focus on technologies that not only improve patient care and outcomes, which is obviously the most important piece, but provides you kind of new revenue sources. Um, so number three, new patients. So kind of recap real quick. We can increase revenue by keeping everything the same or simply increasing our fees, right? We can increase revenue by adding new services um, or uh, to our existing patient base, um, or we can acquire new patients. Uh, we've largely done through marketing, right? So um, dental practice marketing in and of itself could be kind of a series of webinars. And nowadays, you know, there's so many different ways to actually market your practice. Obviously, we don't have enough time here to delve deeply into the topic, but uh, needless to say, kind of competition is fierce. You know, long gone are the days of being able to kind of just open your doors and have patients come rushing in. Uh, you need to attract those patients somehow, um, and developing a marketing plan is kind of the first step to doing that. Um, it's estimated that obviously practices spend around 10% of their annual revenue on marketing expenses, which can be a fair amount of money, um, and you want to do that wisely. Some of the best advice um, Simp here is going to simply be able to track your ROI or your return on investment for each and every marketing activity that you do. So if you can't track it, it's difficult to prove it actually worked. There are a lot of ways to market. It used to be that you could just call up your yellow pages, place an ad. And those days are long gone, unfortunately. Um, there's a host of different options out there. Kind of developing your website, social media, search engine optimization, local events, um, and played old word of mouth. Um, and as you probably have heard, you know, Word of mouth is you know, still some of the best marketing you can do, but have you actually sat down and thought through how you're going to facilitate those word of mouth referrals, right? So you have standard scripting, do you have um, uh, tablets at the chair side when patients are checking out to give you reviews, those types of things. So it's really important to sit down and actually have a well thought out marketing plan and not just be 
um, trying trial through, through trial and error different types of advertising um, and marketing activities. Um, proactive communication discussion with staff. Um, so this too seems kind of counterintuitive. Uh, why would you proactively have a conversation about wages with your staff? Well, the reality is this has likely already happened. Um, the ADA recently came out with a stat that 80% of dentists reported an increasing pay for hygienists and assistants in the last year. So don't be afraid to discuss it with your teams. Um, as we mentioned previously, salaries and wages are likely your largest expense. But the cost of losing staff in this ultra competitive market can be really detrimental. So kind of each and every office dynamic is different, um, but creating kind of an open and honest dialogue with your staff uh, can contribute to kind of not only positive morale, but create efficiency. They know your staff, uh, and they know costs are up um, and they feel it every day, just like you do. So kind of outlining to them that practice, the practice needs to be careful with expenses and kind of rallying around that, uh, limiting excess spending, I mean, getting their feedback to drive efficiency um, is really, again, a kind of prudent business practice. Um, so lastly, and certainly not least, we've got to talk about the numbers, right? So um, as it says in the slide, kind of consult with your financial advisor uh, and review your business plan to identify specific areas of improvement. So one of the many nice things about kind of the business of dentistry is that kind of in general, overhead expenses tend to fall in certain ranges, right? So um, dental specific advisors, be that kind of your, your CPA, your financial advisor, your consultant can and kind of should be able to uh, assist you in constantly reviewing your practice financials to ensure your expenses fall within normal ranges. That being said, um, it's not just about the review of your financials, kind of high performing practices review their financials kind of in conjunction with a kind of clear business plan. Your financial statements tell you kind of where you've been and where you are, um, but developing a business, an actual business plan illustrates kind of where you wanna go. Um, it's not just for practitioners who are starting a new practice or expanding, it should be kind of a constantly evolving document. If you're not sure where to start with a business plan, we've kind of got We've got uh, comprehensive templates that shine and kind of guide you through building one. Um, all that being said, uh, one uh, additional specific item that you want to ensure you're reviewing is your lease. Not only because occupancy cost is likely your second largest expense, but also because it has the potential to be one of the most important factors for the long-term success of your practice and the ability to maximize profit and potential sale. Um, so uh, much more of that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Eric to go through all that is uh, talking about your lease. Thank you, Jim. Great best practices there. Uh, and I know a few of you joined a little later. I, let's just throw a little a little pulse check up. Um, and you know, let's let's think about the future. You should be able to see a thumbs up or a thumbs down. So the question is. How are you feeling about the future and the short-term future? Uh, are you feeling positive, optimistic? If so, thumbs up. If you're feeling concerned, a little nervousness, hesitation, let's do a thumbs down. So a uh, quick little pulse check that's popping up here in front of you. Uh, and this is relevant for a few reasons. Number one is as the owner of the business, you know, good God, look what you've gone through, right? As, as a business owner myself, there is no shortage of highs and or lows that the global pandemic had, then let alone the impact of dentistry, as Jim mentioned, which suddenly now was this wage inflation that was coming through. And suddenly now just to secure the staff or get them back to work came with all sorts of significant rate increases. Uh, and now with the additional of an inflation, sort of the rest of the market is caught up to what you've been feeling. So first of all, if nobody's patted you on the back recently, uh, certainly it, you're overdue for it. Uh, and in addition to that, again, as the business owner, as Jim was saying, look, they, the staff, no costs are up. But quite frankly, they don't care. Right? It is you that are bearing the, the brunt of these. And you as the business owner need to be thinking about what strategically you can do now moving forward. So first of all, great, right? And roughly half of you that have uh, answered so far, the majority of you are a thumbs up uh, and a handful of you are a thumbs down. So let's dig into that a little bit more because quite frankly, you know, as a dentist, historically, 
And as a little bit of background on Cirrus, Cirrus Consulting Group has been around now for 27 years, founded by a group of doctors for doctors specifically to ensure that they were not being taken advantage of landlords and helping to make sure that they were well represented through engagements with landlords and negotiating financial and, and dental specific language in their lease agreement. So uh, Cirrus has seen everything back all the way to 1994. So all of those rises and falls, as Jim showed us, right, we were there to help us, our clients with a steady hand, some of which our lease negotiators have been with us for over 20 years. So, you know, a, a couple of positives to kick us off with. First of all is the dental profession historically have weathered, you know, in inflationary times and recessions or otherwise, because on the hierarchy of needs, right? Certainly, uh, as my wife can can represent right now, that any sort of tooth pain by far is the highest and most priority. Uh, secondarily, as anybody that delays it, as they did through COVID, it's not getting any better, right? Which creates a great buildup of potential demand for the general dentists of you. Right. Historically, as again, well ahead of the curve, where in many cases, just referring less deals out and choosing to do a little bit more of that impacted third or other type of work that you don't necessarily enjoy and that would sometimes refer out, you now have the ability to bring that back in house, right, in terms of as an additional revenue stream. Uh, also, many of you, especially those contemplating transitioning in the future, it can be a great opportunity to instantly increase revenue by bringing in a specialist once or twice a month for that additional work that you don't want to do yourself that can do on a revenue split model, et cetera. So these are just some of the strategies that we're seeing and assisting our clients with as we're looking at the lease renewals, expansions, buying, building, renovating, relocating, uh, or playing or planning for that eventual transition. So from that perspective, uh, for those of you, especially those of you that are in a status of renewing your lease. So we always suggest typically about two, in some cases now with COVID, two year, two and a half years prior to expiry can be the best time to start the renewal negotiations with the landlord. Why? Well, more often than not, it can be upwards of 18 months plus to relocate a practice today. Some of the equipment providers, it's, it's months, if not into the years, from order to actual delivery. So the earlier and the more time you have, the more leverage you have. The landlord's going to run out that clock. So strategically, or if you're expanding, I just got off a call with the doctor that just you know was humming, was now the right time, should I, should I not? And I said, look, fast forward two years from now, five years from now, if that spot next to you, you're already at capacity, you're at $350,000 per chair. If that space next to you got gobbled up with a new 10-year lease, how much would you be kicking yourself as you drove in and out of your practice for the next 10 years? And she said, you're absolutely right. So this was, again, a great example of a doctor that had been contemplating expansion, right? Was humming and hawing, the landlord was, you know, trying to do the pressure sale, et cetera. And in the end, now, great. I do want to go through the due diligence to see what it would look like. What would the landlord be willing to do to blend and extend my lease from the current space into the adjacent suite next door? And what impact could that have? And quite frankly, that's what we see in front of us. There's seven main financial variables. Quite frankly, there's dozens, but these are some of the seven main. So as you look forward, don't forget the landlords are feeling the squeeze as well. There, we saw the mortgage rates, right? Looking across their spectrum, they've got all these locked in leases. Suddenly now their mortgage comes up for renewal. They've got a massive increase depending on when that was initiated. So again, to your benefit, the landlord's going to take one of two pathways. And we have over 300 active negotiations going on right now. So we're seeing the path of, of two components. One is the base rent. Some landlords are already coming back and saying, hey, hey I saw a gym seminar. I want a 10% rent increase because we feel you're under market and our costs are going up. And now we're going to reset your rent to be X, right? X plus 10% is the first one. The second uh, framework is then the annual increases. So not only are we going to increase it, but oh my gosh, geez, I saw this webinar and now it's just going to keep on going up and up. So we want another 5% per year every single year afterwards for the next five or 10 years. So this is what we're seeing today. Landlords taking this type of, of news, doom and gloom, et cetera, 
and using it as a negotiation tactic to dramatically raise their own rents and annual increases, et cetera. Then, right, the next whammy will be is when the uh, common area maintenance comes up. Now, this is very negotiable, right? There can be exclusions. There can be uh, audit rights. There can be all sorts of perspectives and components negotiated within your lease to ensure that you have protection in there and you're not hit with a wallop of an annual bill because suddenly all of the landscaping and then electricity and other fees that the landlord's been incurring hits you at the end of the year as a, as a big, massive uh, true-up period. And then especially those of you into number four that are contemplating uh, buying, building your first practice. Again, that Rockefeller approach still has rung very true for many of you that, again, if your thought is that interest rates are going to continue to rise in comparison from what it was in the 80s or as Jim even showed not too long ago, it's still incredibly cheap money now, right? So if there has, and if there is a business need to expand and to capitalize on that demand versus a competitor or a corporation or otherwise moving in now down the street, right? Again, that kicks yourself. So a fixturing period, not uncommon to ask for multiple months while you're building out, right? Without any rent payment. And then once the lease commences, the meter starts ticking, not uncommon to ask and be successful in getting multiple months worth of free rent after that, right? So that can dramatically impact it. If you're thinking of a relocation, it minimizes any double rent, or if you're building out, but a great opportunity to minimize that impact to cash flow as you're opening that second practice or the first one as well. So again, great. We ended up with more positives than, um, than negatives there, which is key because you, by the way, doctors, are the best tenants on the planet. Highest build out costs, upwards of $300 plus per square foot. We have clients in the Bay Area, $400 per square foot. If you haven't done a build out lately, it's shocking how expensive that is. That makes your own practice, right? Quite, quite impactful. But the highest build out costs, the lowest default rates at 0.5%, right? In comparison to restaurants or otherwise that are almost the opposite. So again, as a tenancy, the likelihood of you being there after 10 years is dramatically higher than really any other. You bring in high quality foot traffic, you're COVID proof because there's no working from home, right? And really, most importantly, you're in the same location for over 26 and a half years on average. And even after you may sell, that practice tends to continue on in that same location. So that gives the opportunity for really tenant improvement allowance, which Jim was mentioning. As you're contemplating uh, equipment or making any capital expenditures or uh, just making any renovations. Don't forget, landlords have money and budget for that, especially if you've been a long-term tenant. We just did the, the lease for the doctor of the um, San Francisco Giants, uh, Dr. Thatcher. We did a great video. And just as part of the regular renewal process, we were able to secure them another six or $7,000 for paint, flooring, et cetera, on top of getting some significant uh, legal wins as well as business flaws and financial wins as well. So bottom line, there's many of these components that in your negotiations, don't take that you know, thumbs up of positivity as many of you had and start to strategically use that to your advantage by starting early and doing it properly. Now, the flip side of that is how do we help to protect ourselves? And again, if there's one thing that COVID has shown us, it's that the unknown can occur. And how do we protect ourselves from that? So for those of you that own your own building, this is just as applicable for you. So this is one that we do at the Dental Business Institute when uh, we used to be back at headquarters in West Allis, Wisconsin. Number one, who owns the building? Is it personally or is it in your corporation? Number two, who owns the practice? Same question, personal corporation. Are you paying yourself rent today? We did a great webinar. We have another one coming up in a couple of months for tax strategies. And one of the main concerns here are if you're not paying yourself rent today, right, or if you're overinflating or underinflating, that can be a significant issue as it pertains to audits, right? Or, you know, just effective tax planning. So it can be critically important that a lease is in place between, which is question five. Do you have a lease root, a lease in place? And no, not just something you downloaded from the internet the day that you had to secure your mortgage, but something that's actually properly drafted that heaven forbid if you were able to pass away 
right? If you were to pass away, right, and your estate wanted to keep the asset of the building, yet sell the practice separately, right? Is it structured that way to allow for a emergency exit as the dental practice transition team shares? Um, no different than your wills and estate planning. And more importantly, again, if you are thinking of maintaining that asset as a passive form of income, your building, and then sell your practice, then having very clear separated financials for many years only helps to add clarity and make the valuation process and make the due diligence process of the buyer that much easier. So from that, for the leasing, Right. Uh, we'll do. We'll do. Can I do another pulse check here? How do we do this? Is that a pulse check. Do another one. Here's another pulse check. So again, for those of you leasing, quick thumbs up. So number one, do you know when your lease expires? If there's if there's one key takeaway from today is right in your phones, add when the lease expires, and then quite frankly, more importantly, when does your option to renew deadline date? Meaning that in your lease buried away in page 86, subsection two, right, there is specific language that states that you, six months in advance, three months in advance, or 12 months in advance, must give written notice to the landlord when the sun is aligned with Mercury and Venus by a carrier pigeon, right? You must deliver notice. You like that one, Jim? Right? You must deliver that notice. And if not, that option becomes null and void. And unfortunately, we've, we have three files on our desk where the doctor right now had forgotten to do it. And suddenly now the landlord is saying, great, well, I don't have to move you now. I don't have to incur this cost and I can you know, throw you out at the end of the term. So those dates, if you don't have that handy, certainly uh, you can either send us a copy of it. You've got our email address at the bottom if you're not sure. But these are the type of dates that you want to have well in advance. And quite frankly, we always suggest having the new lease negotiated long before that option to renew deadline. That's the date that's sort of the guns to the head to say, look, I agree to everything within this lease with the exception of rent. So again, proactive strategies, just as Jim was saying with inflation is don't get stuck in landlord's traps. Start dramatically earlier. Don't fall into the well, you missed this or you forgot that and now here's your new increase or you're out. Because again, a relocation right now, a forced relocation, as uh, as you can imagine, is devastating. Now, let's think about liability for a second. I won't ask for a thumbs up here from uh, from that. But for those of you that have a lease and are following along, are you named personally as the named tenant or is it in your corporation? And then also, is there any indemnification or personal guarantee? By that, we're referring to a section within the lease that in the event of a dispute with the landlord or otherwise, the landlord has the opportunity to come back after you or your estate personally. As, your, as the lease, as some of you may be shocked to know, is binding to your spouse, to your kids, to your successors and heirs, which is in almost every single lease. Right. And from that perspective, right, are you liable? And then if you are to sell, right, are you continually and personally liable even after you've sold the practice through the continuing liability provision? Which, again, is probably in over 85 percent to 90 percent of leases. So these are the type of things that as much as we're focused on today and what's going on, it also gives us a perfect opportunity to hit that reset button to ensure that we're aware of exactly what is in our leases today. And more importantly, how do we leverage what is, uh, again, just as much challenge and strife for the landlord that you can now use to your advantage because you have survived through right, the COVID time. And now we wanna help to give yourself as much runway as possible so you're not into a forced situation as we unfortunately have seen a number of lately with both demolition and relocation rates where literally the landlord could give notice for any reason whatsoever that six months and they're going to demolish and you are out or even worse, right? We had one recently that got a three month notice. They're, they're being relocated to the basement at the same rate of ground floor, right? Purely because of, right? The T's and C's within their lease agreement. 
So for a practical example here is a few components. Number one is being aware of a right of first refusal. So those of you that are all part of the thumbs up pulse check we had a few minutes ago, right, is now look at this as a great opportunity to, again, make some of those strategic investments and look at how to, if now is not the right time, how do you give yourself as much protection of that moving forward? So one of those is a ROFR, a right of first refusal. So if there is the opportunity that the adjacent suite becomes available in the future, great news, you've got the opportunity to take advantage of that. And more importantly, there's not a competing orthodontist or pedodontist or otherwise that might come in and try to negotiate exclusivity over one of those subspecialties, which unfortunately is happening more often, right? which could be a dramatic impact to the GPs right, that are take, getting a certain amount of their production from some of those special specialty services. Now, again, we know that easily you can be providing all these services, but in the landlord space, the landlord can control all the way down to the type of procedures you can be doing in their space. And we've seen a number of examples where the landlord, in exchange of a higher rent, has given exclusivity to one of those specialty or other dentists moving into the space. So as, as the old adage is, right, in life, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate for. The surrender clause. So this is another biggie. Demolition costs of leaving a clinic or thinking of relocating, it might not be that easy. Many of you have a clause that require you to return it to pre-dental condition upon your exit or removing any of those leasehold improvements, walls, floor, medical grade plumbing, electrical, et cetera, right? Which could easily be 10 or $15,000 on your exit. So be careful of what's in there because if I was advising a buyer for your practice, I would say it's worth that much less because they're taking on that liability from that lease that you may have assigned or absorbed that might've gone back all the way back to 1983, right? And then really being aware of uh, again, in the event of an expansion or relocation, how do you help to minimize any potential downtime and support cash flow all the way through? Good news. Jim and I uh, and Dr. Severance are all here. We're going to go through each and every one of these clauses tonight and go through them in the nth degree in detail. If there is any questions to any of these Right? If you're not sure of what is within your lease, if you're not sure of where some of those $100,000 risks and clauses are, I cannot stress that enough to uh, schedule a time with our team, send us a quick email, or we'll pull up a poll here before the end. But these are the type of things. First and foremost, a death and disability clause right in the middle here. Right? If, if you don't have a death and disability clause, Right? and you're making notes, that is definitely something that I cannot stress enough to add to your next lease negotiation. Let it be a renewal, let it be you know, your next expansion or just signing up a new lease or a new location. The death and disability gives you an exit right or your estate an exit right to terminate. Right? This gives you the protection. There was a devastating example of a doctor north of our office who was 43 years of age, built at a beautiful six operatory practice pre-COVID, right? and unfortunately, just prior to the grand opening, died of a massive heart attack. Fully built out practice, no doctor, no patients. We don't have to be a practice broker or analyst to know that what's that practice worth. Devastatingly, Right. Zero. Devastatingly, the landlord went back to the spouse and said, unfortunately, Mrs. Smith, you're now responsible for the $9,000 a month, increasing at 4% per year for the remaining nine and a half years on the lease. The reason why we at Cirrus get very passionate about this is had that doctor had some professional representation, representation there could have been some of this dental specific language added in that could have given his spouse the ability to say, hey, here's three months notice, I'm done, right? Or at least if it had been the other way around, if it had been towards the end of his career, the ability for the spouse to come through and to say, good, I can renew the lease on behalf of my spouse and not be held in default because the spouse is no longer there, right? To give more protection, to allow the lease to renew in preparation for the sale. 
And unfortunately, these happen more often than not. This is just one of the dozens of specific clauses to be aware of. Um, in others, right, there can be financial statements. Right? Financial statements through here is very common. Landlords tend to ask for these types of things, which is a core component. Right. So a quick question as we went through and we'll cover some of these at the end as well. But the, the question that popped up a minute ago was the practice is set up as an LLC. So personal assets to the dentist are protected. Is that correct? So yes and no, uh, Dr. Mann. The question here is if the lease is in the LLC, first of all, good first step. But the second question is, is there any other representation through there about any indemnification language or personal guarantee language, which we can see here on the slide, which can be an appendix, it can be hidden uh, some way through, it could include your spouse or otherwise. So in short, the LLC is a great way to add a protective shield, right? But that can be pierced. So you know, a uh, litigation attorney or otherwise can give more specifics on that. Our, our proactive view to these types of negotiations are uh, in a chronology of, of best to worst is we do want to have your LLC in the name tenant. We then want to remove any personal guarantee or limit that personal guarantee or indemnification, right? And uh, and again, we want to make sure that the continuing liability for either your corp or yourself personally is done by the time that you assign the lease and transfer it on. And it doesn't continue on indefinitely into the future. So that's a, a, a perf perfect segue through to personal guarantees. So let's give a practical example and we'll open them up for some more Q&As before we get uh, through to the end here. So this is one clause. Again, for those of you following along. This is one example found in about 90% of leases. This is the option to renew clause. This is great for tenants, not as great for landlords, but there's some hooks in, and there's written very much in the landlord's favor, which is the whole reason why we exist, right? Landlords, it's the world's oldest profession. They are the Lord of the land, right? They choose what, how, when, where, and they've spent hundreds of years perfecting these types of leases to make them almost exclusively in the landlord's favor. All we do here at Cirrus is to help take that pendulum of feeling like you're being, you know, dangling up in the air right, and making that equal and fair in terms of having a fair lease, especially based on the amount that you're spending on a monthly and annual basis and let alone over the next 10 plus years. So, if you haven't had a quick read through this, right, try to find any particular red flags and issues through this one clause within the lease. Did you find this first? Provided that Dr. Joe Black shall remain as the tent. So this is a big one. So to Dr. M below that asked the first question, if it's in his corporation, great. But if hidden in the lease in Article 67, subsection 3, it states that only you can exercise that option to stay for another five or 10 years, that does nothing for your buyer. And if you've not bought and sold the practice recently, the major banks, Bank of America or otherwise, if there's insufficient term on the lease, they will not approve a buyer because there's no assurance that they'll be able to stay in the space for a period of time. So term, right? As many of you may think, hey, the shorter the term, the better. In many cases, it's the opposite. If you don't have that ability to stay and just ask yourself, right? If you drove to the office tomorrow and the key didn't work, how much is your practice worth? So our view is options and lots of them. Let's give our buyer the ability to transfer the option so they can stay. Because if they're going to pay you $1.5 million to buy your practice, they're not going to want to move in a couple of years from now. They got to pay back that massive loan. To do so, they need to make sure they've got lots of runway and that those keys work. Number two, right? If the tenant duly and has regularly paid its rent, has performed all of its covenants and obligations under the lease and does not be in default, default. 
as you notice, capital D is a defined term. Interesting about that is that there can be a whole host of things. And in one example we had, which was just, just, just sometimes we think we've seen it all. The doctor had received notice when she wanted, she'd been a perfect tenant. She paid all the rent all ta- on time. She paid in advance. She knew about the option to renew. She sent notice well in advance. She did everything right. The landlord wrote her back and said, unfortunately, we found you to be in material default. And no, we will not be exercising your option. Quite frankly, you will be required to vacate the premises within the next four months. Shocked. She reaches out. We reach out to the landlord and say, look, what, why? Help us understand. And after digging, they sent us a photo, one single photo. What do you think that photo was of? Waiting for Jim to throw a guess out there. It was the front door. The front door listed her hours of operation. And it showed Monday, Monday, Tuesday, regular hours, closed Wednesday was an admin day, Thursday, Friday, right? And then opened every second Saturday. That was the clause because hidden in the lease was a minimum operation clause. And it was enough that the landlord that wanted that doctor out only to bring in a coffee shop. There was a coffee shop that wanted that spot. And the landlord and their team found that little loophole, and that was enough to move the doctor out. She was forced to relocate, right? Cost over $300,000. So being aware of even the smallest nuances of how or when you can be held in default can be critical, right? This is another biggie. What a beautiful business here, right, as a landlord. This, This one little sentence allows the landlord the ability to basically hit the reset button And when you come up for renewal, whatever you negotiated previously, hey, we tear it up and here's a whole new lease. Congratulations. Just as as we were getting ahead, suddenly now the landlord pulls the rug out from under us. So that one little sentence gives the ability that the landlord can really tear up the old lease, put in a new one, and suddenly start start a whole new section all over again. Uh, In addition to that, in no event shall it be less than the rent paid in the last year of the original term which is the world's most boring roller coaster. Talk about inflation, right? This is, this is guaranteed inflation. This is this, the landlord saying that, you know, you're signing a five or a 10 year term, then you renew, well, you can renew, but hey, if the market goes down, doesn't matter, you're continuing to go up and up and up, right? So these types of things that as we're thinking about all of the other costs, don't forget the second biggest expense, which is your rent. Right. And last but not least, right, be cautious because if suddenly other tenants in the building have not done a good job structuring and negotiating their lease and suddenly everybody's paying more, well, good news, yours has just gone up dramatically as well. So one single clause, right, and the cost here can be devastating. Lots of examples and case studies. You know, here's an example of a doctor that had a similar situation. She tried to sell her practice three separate times. She wrote a beautiful five-star Google review, but at 74 years of age, she was forced to relocate because the landlord refused to allow her to assign the lease to a future buyer. She had three buyers each time the landlord came back and said no. Why? The landlord right, had a restaurant in the building, wanted to take over her space, and under no circumstances would let her. So she hired us. We moved her 10 minutes north, right? and you know, she said it was the best money she'd spent on the practice. These are the type of proactive things that we could prevent by having those options to renew in as much term as possible and a properly structured uh, assignment language to ensure that right, the continuity of revenue continues. So how do we solve all of these challenges? What are our strategies? Well, as Jim covered a number of them, right, one of the tried and true is to start early. Right? How do we how, how do we get some strategies to fight inflation? Start now. Don't put our heads in the sand. Don't wait until what the landlord's going to come back at us with. Start early. Right. Start. In many cases, we're drafting a proposal to put that check in their hand. Right. When you look at your nine thousand dollars a month, increasing it 
you know, three or four percent per year over the next 10, 15, 20 years, you got a multi-million dollar commitment. That's the dangling of the check that you represent to the landlord. You would be amazed at what they'd be willing to accept, right? Especially in exchange for that long-term commitment. So start 24 months early. That's the best way to start, right? And don't fall into the trap where the landlord says, ah, it's too early. Ah, we'll wait. Suddenly 12 months pass. Ah, oh, no, you know, it's still a little early. It's unknown. Oh, I'd watched Jim's webinar and he said it was going to be, you know, all sorts of things were going to happen. I want to wait. And suddenly now, whoops, your option for new deadline is nine months. And suddenly now the landlords, right, skipped it, probably pur purposely. And suddenly now your those remaining two five-year options have become null and void. Start early, right? Complete early. And here's eight key steps. Here's a great one to do a quick screen, screenshot of this over 27 years. Here's some of the best strategies we've found to help fight inflation, help fight uh, high rents, and how to help to minimize that risk and liability. Number one is get all the information. Uh, if you don't, you should have, as part of any of the government incentives, et cetera, you should have a digital copy of your lease signed by both you and the landlord. If it's just signed by you, quite frankly, it's not worth the paper it's written on. So getting all that information, you can email the landlord now to say, hey, I'm digitizing my records, or just simply, can you send me a digital copy of my original lease and any addendums, riders, or exhibits? Anything that you may have signed over the years, they should be able to send it back to you momentarily. Number two. Right. Just as Jim was mentioning, let's start thinking ahead. Let's start thinking about goals. Let's start thinking about where the investment is, where we want to be frugal, and how we want to navigate the next two few, few years as a business owner. Number three is to have your lease professionally reviewed. If you haven't had it before, if you haven't done it in a few years, or you're just not sure of some even one of the com uh, components here, right? have your lease professionally reviewed. It is worth it. It's worth the investment. It's worth your time. And more importantly, it's worth it to at least just know what is hidden within your lease to at least ensure that you know the facts. Um, number four is to follow up with the market research, right? We have all the commercial real estate data from coast to coast to coast to coast throughout the continent to be able to see rental rates, vacancies, right? In some cases, even demographics details. And number five is figure out the strategy. Every single negotiation is a carefully choreographed game of chess. You want to think ahead to all the way in the end. What am I willing to give up as part of my negotiation strategy? What am I willing to, what am I wanting to, uh, you know, keep? What are my must-haves? What are my nice-to-haves, right? But as we've looked at numbers one, two, three, four, and five, what have we now, what have we not done yet? We've yet to right, pick up the phone and call the landlord. Right? So please don't come off the webinar and call the landlord first thing tomorrow and say, hey, I watched a great webinar. I'm going to skip steps one through five. And hey, what do you want to charge me, Mr. Landlord? Right? Uh, right? Do the prep, do the due diligence, and then ensure that you've got a full strategy before you pick up the phone because the landlords don't forget. They don't place crowns. They don't do interoral scannings. Right? They certainly don't do any endodontic procedures, nor replace impacted thirds, right? Extract impacted thirds. What they do is negotiate leases all day, every day, right? So if this is not something that you do all day, every day, right? Our mantra has always been keep doctors chair side, right? Let, let us handle the rest. So from that perspective, uh, again, in appreciation of everyone's time, we will do a full critical dates and risk analysis. We will spend multiple hours analyzing the lease, looking through traps, right? helping to identify if you're paying above or market rents, right? and most importantly, helping to create a negotiation treatment plan. Right? I can assure you it will be the best hour you spend talking about the business side of your practice right? and help really ensuring that your long-term strategy sees all the way through your eventual transition. And if you're looking to sell in 10 years from now, and you've only got 10 years left on the lease, well, you've missed the whole issue when you go to sell. You're not going to have any term left. It's like my kids in the Pirate of the Caribbean. If you keep renewing that lease, you're going to hit the end. I have nowhere to go. You're going to go. You're going to fall into the water, right? So from that perspective, keeping it, keeping it easy, there's a quick poll 
uh, and we'll give it some more time here to go through. So situations being urgent. We did have a number of you reach out already prematurely to say we are concerned with the lease. We're concerned with the fact that A, we're in a month to month tenancy or B, we can't find our lease. We're not sure if we did exercise that last option or not. Right? Number three is I'm contemplating selling within the next two or three years. Right? And number four is I think my landlord's really taking me for a ride. So if, if any of those, I would certainly say adjust to a urgency. We will prioritize those. The last webinar we had, we had over 100 uh, hand raisers in terms of to prioritize some of the calls afterwards and strategies. And again, if it is of an urgent nature, we select that accordingly. Now, part two, as I know some of you uh, have posted here in the notes, did not have a chance to click this originally, as you may have joined a few minutes late. Uh, this, again, can't stress, is probably one of the best opportunities to uh, in appreciation of everyone's time, be able to schedule that call with either myself or the team to know what's in the lease. We can get together on a Zoom. We can literally go through the sections that you had signed and initialed so you're clear as to what impact they have, right? What impacts there may be. And also, let's look at the rents. Let's look at what other tenants may be paying in the building. Let's look at the couple of hundred other doctors' uh, types of deals that we've done in your area and how you compare that one right really helps to ensure that as you look forward as you're looking to weather these types of storms right do you have all the facts and figures right uh, as jim was mentioning as you're looking ahead one of the best things you can do is connecting with some of jim and his team as you're contemplating these components you've got lots of resources that are here to help Right? And one of the key and great advantages of, of Henry Shine is, is look, right? we care about your profit and your business. Right? We care about making sure that you're avoiding these surprises or slush balls, as I call them, that come out of mid, you know, the, the midair, the old Calvin and Hobbes, right? the big slush ball that hits you in the side of the face that completely blindsides you. Right? These are the type of things that you can be proactive with, but it just starts with saying, you know what, now is the time that it's you know worth it. Let's have a look, right? And let's make sure that even if it's your know, lease isn't renewing for another five, six, seven, ten years from now, can still be an incredibly worthwhile conversation to figure out strategy, to look at what rental rates are, and especially those of you contemplating an expansion, contemplating a renovation. We've seen landlords pay for some of those renovations because if the doctor's about to spend 150 grand, right, and Jim's team has done a full right financing structure for you, and your lease expires in two years from now, what do you think the landlord's going to do in two years from now, right? They're going to laugh and say, "Well, you just spent 150 grand. You're not going anywhere. Here's a big rent increase. Congratulations!" Right. So use this as a great opportunity to look proactively, right? To look to see how some of the corporations look at this. How are they leveraging these uncertainties and how to help benefit from the 13,000 other successful lease negotiations we've done in the past. So with that being said, some great questions. I see the Q&A box has come through. I know there has been a lot of questions. We sent through some of the pre-emails. As we approach the uh, 9, 9 p.m., 8 p.m. in Dallas for Dr. Severance uh, and for the gym, for Jim and I on the East Coast, uh, I'll throw it into some Q&A. And, uh, and maybe, Dr. Severance, you, you've seen, you're seeing a lot in terms of events, presentations, right, and clients. Uh, anything to, uh, to add or questions that you've seen from some of your colleagues or otherwise as it pertains now to all of the things we've touched on today to put you on the spot. Well, thank you both for number one. Thank you both for participating tonight and presenting. And yeah, Eric, I think this is one of the most important things because as good as your dentistry can be, uh, it can end your per career or location pretty quick. So it's outside necessarily the expertise of many of the clinicians there. And so having the time, foresight, going through your eight steps, I think is a wonderful idea and something that shouldn't be hesitant at all. 
uh, because it can extend your dental career or even uh, minimize it if you're making that much money in your practice. So all good practices. But yeah, sometimes uh, we get oral fixation, we call it. All we do is look in the mouth all day. So it's good to get an oversight of what the practice is. So I did want to thank you very much. Any questions, we'll email to both of you as well, but continue. And make sure you see on the right-hand side of your screen, you can schedule a complimentary lease review. Uh, click on that Schedule Now widget on the right side. And we did record tonight's webinar, and we'll email the recording out sometime in the next week. So go back and look at those eight steps. Go back and look at where the economy is going. We would appreciate your feedback on our surveys as well. A little pop-up will come off, uh, come on right when we're finished. And thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful evening. We look forward to you on the next webinar. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Jim. Have a good night. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Sounds. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your time. Have a good night.